I look at myself as a student of life, a person who wants to always learn. So when I have a debate with somebody, I want to have intellectual honest debate where we look for truth, because at some point in time we'll discover it. This, this is really uh, a very uh, exciting evening for Vitaly and for me. Uh, I, I met Vitaly for the first time in um, about, about 23 years ago this week. Uh, he came into my office uh, with his uh, wife-to-be, Rachel, and um, to talk about a marriage ceremony at the Maverick restaurant, which was then the Russian restaurant in Denver. And uh, at the time I thought, oh well, another Russian-Russian wedding, uh, which I was famous for in the city at the time. I seemed to be marrying everybody who was from a foreign country at that time. And um, so I thought nothing of it. I just, two wonderful young people, and I was really pleased to be able to do the wedding. It was a fun wedding. And uh, that, was, that was the end of that until, I don't know, what, about four years ago, five years ago. All of a sudden I get this article, um, and, and out of a clear blue sky, uh, a little comment on the article. It says, uh, I, I really respect you as a, a writer and a thinker. Would you take a look at this and let me know what you think? Fatali, I remember that name. And I read the article and I sent back copious comments on it, one or two, and, um, but copious. Uh, and and uh, the next thing I know, uh, Vitaly and I are sharing email addresses and the next thing I know, we're writing to each other. And the next thing I know, we're going on walks together. And uh, those walks have been among the most uh, memorable days uh, of, of the last four years. Um, our last walk, our latest walk was this last Monday, three point, what, three and a half hours, three and a quarter hours, uh, three and some miles. and. Um, it's not the walk, it's the discussions that we get into uh, on the way around this park or down this path or wherever we happen to go, a different place each time. Uh, Vitaly's a, a, a well-respected financial advisor, financial planner, uh, money manager, uh, whatever you want to call him, just don't call him a stockbroker. Um, and. Uh, He's written a number of books on finances, and his books have been translated into several languages, and he, books are very well respected. Uh, his specialty is value investing, uh, and so he follows in the footsteps of, uh, of uh, Graham and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and the Wizard of Omaha. And, uh, so therefore, you know, when he started to send me articles that were non-investment related, I'm thinking, what's going on here? And the next thing I know, he's writing this book called Soul in the Game. Um, Vitaly mentioned that uh, when he first went to Barnes and Noble, the local one, uh, he couldn't find a copy of the book and he knew they had it. Uh, so he looked all over the spirituality section, he looked all, not spirituality, he looked all over the um, uh, self-help section, uh, and he finally found it in the religion spirituality section because of the word soul. And then I mentioned to him that he probably should have also looked in the sports section because of the word game. <laughs> And, um, and, and so he's, he's written this book and he's here tonight actually to talk about it. And uh, I think you'll enjoy what he has to say. So let's start with um, maybe spending a minute or so uh, telling us about your personal history and uh, how you came to make investing in the markets your life career. Hit the button on the bottom. Well, first of all, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Um, 
For me, it's a very surreal experience to be here for so many reasons. Let me explain you why. Number one, I was married at this synagogue. And number two, my son Jonah right there was circumcised in this synagogue. <laughs> uh, number three, uh, Rabbi Zverin, the person I have an incredible respect for, is having this conversation with me, and I, I cannot tell you how much it means to me. And number four, just go with me for a second. Imagine J.K. Rowling's has a Harry Potter thing like this, and every character from the book is sitting, you know, kind of in one of those roles. That's exactly what's happening right now. My, my family is here, and they're part of the book. My, you know, my, 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 my friends are here, so as we have this discussion, you, know, the, it's, it's, you realize my family are a very big part of the book, and they're the characters of the book. So I'm, when you write a book, and they're not really in front of you, so you, it's not really you're talking you know, kind of behind their back, but, <laughs> but right now I have to kind of talk about them, and they're right now staring at me, so that's, that's a little bit surreal. Um, anyway, um, so I, let me to kind of explain how I got into investing, I kind of have to explain how I got to the United States. So my, um, I have to go a little bit further than just me. So my, both, uh, from both sides, my parents were, my ancestors came from Vitebsk, which is a small village in Belarus, which is a, uh, Mark Chagall was born there. And I was reminded of Mark Chagall by my grandmother who told me that they knew the family, they borrowed money from them and never paid it back. So I knew about Mark Chagall from <laughs> before I saw his art. So anyway, my, so my father, so my mom grew up in, you know, during World War II, uh, my mom's family ended up in Saratov, which is a Wog uh, city on the Volga River. My, my father's family ended up in Moscow. And um, my father, in 19, you know, Jewish, in the 1950s, um, uh, basically tried to you know, apply to universities, and not a single university in Moscow would take him because he was Jewish. So he found this city, Murmansk, which if you think about Murmansk for a second, look at the, think about the map of Russia. You're going to go left and up, so northwest. Imagine Norway, the, t the, 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 the furthest tip of Norway, above the Arctic Circle. The Murmansk is 100 miles from there. So there is a long winters, uh, uh, short summers, incredibly cold, uh, basically uh, very little sunlight in the wintertime. And uh, let me tell you how little sunlight. I would go to school in the morning, and it would be dark. The sun would come out maybe for five or 10 minutes at 12 o'clock or so. I would be at school, and I'd miss it. So I'd go back home, and it's dark again. Uh, so for, it's literally for months I would not see sunlight. So anyway, so my father um, uh, f finds this uh, uh, Murmansk University, uh, Maritime University, who would take anybody because nobody wants to live there. So he ended up graduating from that, from the university, and becomes a, you know, he uh, becomes a very respected professor at the univer you know, this university. And um, anyway, so, the, so that's where I grew up. Um, his younger sister left uh, Moscow in 1979, and she moved to New York. Like, this is like Moscow and Hudson story. Like, just, that's you know, a very typical story. Then she marries a rabbi, uh, and she moves from New York to Cheyenne, Wyoming. And uh, yeah, it's uh, out of all places. And so, um, uh, so when she invites my family over, she was so, you know, I'm still so thankful to her that she did not invite us to Cheyenne, and she invited us to Denver. So that's how we ended up in Denver. Um, now, so I came here when I was in 1991. I was 18 years old. I had no idea what I wanted to do in my life. And I, you know, like, I went to South High School, finished actually, you know, uh, finished South, South High School, and uh, then I went to, you know, University of Colorado, tried every single major, uh, and, and ended up uh, taking a finance class, and I liked it. And, you know, and then at the same time, I happened to work for an investment firm. And combination of these things, that's how I got it. I was very lucky. I figured out that I wanted to be in investing when I was maybe 23 years old. So at this point, I very, had a you know, laser focus, and investing, and then over time I discovered value investing, and that's, that's basically how I got in, you know, nice. how I got here. Nice. So uh, when we were talking, um, 
on uh, Monday, <laughs> um, my question was, uh, what is a money manager doing writing a book of, uh, about life? I mean, what does a money manager know about anything except managing money? Uh, but a book on, of, of essentially life philosophy is kind of rare. And you told me the story about uh, a relative, I think your uncle, one of your uncles, uh, to whom you gave a copy of the book, and he told you that the only books he liked to read were history and uh, finances. And so he took a copy of your book and he put it on the shelf that he always has for books that he intends to read later. And then after a couple of months, he took the book off of that shelf and he put it on the shelf of books which he never intends to read. <laughs> and then uh, one day his wife came in and uh, said to him that she had just read your book and she thought it was wonderful. And he immediately searched for it, found it, read your book and called you up and said, I can't believe it. It's really terrific. So how did the idea of writing a book like this come to somebody who has written books about finances? Well, so to add to the story, I think this book, my book was maybe two weeks away from making it from the shelf to the chimney. <laughs> <laughs> that was the next stop. Yeah, that, that was the next stop. So um, I think I have to talk about writing in general, how I got into writing. It was accidental. I never, like, let me tell you, my, I think the only class I failed uh, in CU Denver was writing. Well, it was, you know, which was, um, and, and, they, and I failed not just in CU Denver at first, but also in Russia as well. Um, but in uh, 2004, um, I read an ad by, uh, by the street.com, which is a, was one of the first financial websites that allowed outside contributors who were not professional, um, uh, who were not professional uh, uh, journalists, I guess, to write for them. And they basically, they paid nothing. And, and uh, I knew nothing about writing, so they're overpaying me. Um, and I started writing, and I, and I really, really liked it. And, um, and then, but if you read my articles in the beginning, they were incredibly dry because I had very little self-confidence. And I wanted people to take me seriously, so they were very proper, incredibly boring, like unreadable boring. And then this incredible thing happened. Um, at the time, my son Jonah was maybe two or three years old. Um, I was, I had this TiVo device. This is a piece of electronics, etc. And I had a hard time using it. So I called TiVo technical support. And this was, remember, this is a long time ago. So there, they had a voice recognition system, but it was very new. So it would not understand my Russian accent. Okay, so then what happens? So, but I still need to talk to somebody. So there is this two or three year old Jonah playing with, you know, with a truck or something. And I told, I told Jonah what to say, and he speaks <laughs> into the phone. So this, just imagine this, like this, Jonah has this perfect Disney accent, right? And he's perfectly understood. So anyway, I just told you the gist of the article. Like, you know, there's maybe a few more insights. That was the article. So I sent it, you know, I published this article, and I get this incredible feedback. Was, this article was had as many as few insights as my other articles, but it was, it, it, you know, it, it, you know, it was authentic. It was funny. I was a little bit vulnerable because, you know, because of my accent, um, and that has changed me as a writer, because then I realized that, you know, if you want people to read your articles, they have to, they cannot be boring. So that has changed me as a writer, and then over time. As I've been writing just investment articles, but every single time, was little by little over time, I would introduce characters into my articles, my, my wife, my kids, and start telling stories. And little by little, in kind of these investment stories get diluted by personal stories. And over time, I got the confidence to write about other things. And, and so maybe the last 10, 15 years, maybe 20, 30% of my articles you know, became about other topics than investing. And so, you, as you mentioned, I wrote two books about investing. And you're right. Um, I have a, I'm a, I run, a, you know, I, I'm a money manager. I spend 46 hours a week, you know, a week you know, doing investment research. 
I'm a CFA, so I, so I have the um, credentials to write investment books. But I, who am I to write a, a book about life? But what happened is this, so that I would write these articles and I would you know, get people subscribed to, like, so they would be published sometimes in Financial Times and other publications, but I would always send them out to my readers. And that was magic, because whenever you send out the article to, your, you know, to, you know, to, you know, to people, they respond. And what, what I found that people responded a lot more to my article about, articles about life, and I actually took them seriously. Like, and, they, and over time, it gave me confidence to actually keep writing more about life. Now, during the pandemic, uh, oh, I remember this day clearly. This is, um, um, I wrote an article, so I also love, so we'll get to that later, I'm sure, but I also love classical music. And so my articles, they include, uh, you know, so I, I don't just write about investing in life, but I also write about classical music. So I was gonna write a note about Tchaikovsky uh, string concerto or something, I forget, you know, the, um, and as I was writing about it and learning about it, I realized how much Tchaikovsky suffered writing it. It was an extremely painful experience. And you, you, know, you read his letters about it, and it's a very, very painful experience for him. And then I realized, when we listen to Tchaikovsky, we don't think about it. We just think how great his music is. And that painful experience is very similar to any creative experience, period. Right? When you, you know, when you, if you are a writer, if you are, if you do anything creative, you know, there's plenty of suffering. So I ended up writing this article kind of comparing writing, you know, articles or books or whatever to what Tchaikovsky went through. And after I finished writing it, I realized, oh my God, this actually, if somebody reads it, actually it will help them. And then I thought, well, over the years, I wrote a lot of articles like that, that were published, you know, that if I can put them together as a book, they could help somebody. So that was basically the kernel for the book, you know, the idea for the book. Um, and that, that's, that's how this book came about. So how did you come up with the concept of the title, Soul in the Game? What did that mean to you? So uh, I, I wish I could say when I'm gonna sit down to write the book, I knew it's gonna be called Soul in the Game. Not at all. So um, I wrote the book, I had no title. My editor, the Herman House, which, you know, we would come up with silly titles. I didn't like any one of them. So I called my editor from my previous books, and I said, Pam, I'm struggling with, you know, with, uh, with the titles. The, the editor who did the financial books? Yeah, who my financial books, yeah, who's, who's at this point already retired. This is the blind <laughs> leading the blind. Yeah, that's right, that's right. That's right. <laughs> And uh, she said, well, t send me the table of contents. I sent her the table of contents, and we go through all the chapters. And she's like, what about, there was a chapter there in the book called Soul in a Game. It's the second chapter. She's like, what about Soul in a Game? Th th that was it. <laughs> and then I have to give credit to Brendan, who's sitting right there, came up with the, the Art of Meaningful Life. So, <laughs> so this book is a, I have to, like, uh, whenever you do something very creative, it becomes a team sport. Like my brother Alex designed, the, you know, created the cover, you know, sitting right there. So it's, a, it, uh, so it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's a really team sport. So, but anyways, that's how I came up with Solo Game. Nice. Well, let's see. Um, oh, you were just talking about music, so why don't we go there? There's a section in the book called Melody of Life, in which you talk about a number of composers and their life struggles and the like. So. Um, one of the things I, I love about your articles is every article ends w with a click on selection of a musical composition by one of your favorite uh, composers or a piece of music that you just came across recently and you want to share with everybody. So what, what does classical music mean to you in, in terms of this writing and in terms of your own life? I think uh, for me, Music adds texture to life. My, uh, I was lucky that my parents um, introduced me to classical music, not by forcing me into it, though they did this to my brothers. No, my, my, my older brothers, uh, Alex is one of them, he's sitting there, right there. Um, he, uh, right there, uh, he, uh, they forced him to play piano. Uh, and, um, uh, for many, many years. And then they stopped when, my, uh, when Alex, my oldest brother, literally pulled the keys out of the piano. Oh. So, so, so that's when it stopped. So they didn't do this to me, and I, so I was lucky. Uh, and I was lucky because I, th but they listened to classical music, so I was always exposed to that. So I, 
And as I got older and I moved to the United States and classical music became more accessible because I could buy very cheap CDs at Best Buy for $1.99, I started to listen more and more to classical music. And it's a very important part of my life. Um, it, as I mentioned, a texture to it. And uh, at one point, there was, a, well, um, there was a, this uh, British uh, artist, uh, Freddie Mercury, and he has a song called There Must Be More to Life Than This. And this is when I realized there must be more to life than just writing about investing. And so you know, that explains writing also about not you know, life, but also about music as well. And, um, and over time, so, the, so here's the interesting part. When you write about music, my knowledge got exhausted very quickly. So this, now if I want to write more, I need to learn. And I loved learning in general. So learning about classical music actually became uh, like one of the passions of mine. So I listen to Spotify you know, every morning when I write and always uh, spits out new, song, new pieces of music that you know, I never heard of. So, and then I you know, go on exploration, and that's, that's why I write about it. But I, um, I'm very evangelical about classical music. I want, I want people to listen to it. And I'm trying to be in a, in a good sense of that word, but uh, I want people to listen to classical music. That's why I share it in my art. Does, does classical music impact or have anything to do with investing? Do you see a connection in any way, shape, or form? Or is it just that you love music, you love investing? Well, all right. So, um, so this is, there's a story through this. OK, so uh, to, imagine 20-something you know, years ago, like 2020, I'm sorry, to, uh, year 2000, I read this article that says, you know, like, uh, or, or blip of the article that says basically, if um, kids listen to, to Mozart, they become geniuses or something like this. This is before kind of like internet, this is the early stages of internet, right? So I'm not gonna go to the library and look for exactly the sources, like, okay, well, Mozart, genius, my wife, Rita, Rachel, is pregnant with, uh, with Jordan. So I bought, and I bought uh, this, um, concoction where basically a belt that had a speaker in it <laughs> and, and, and a CD player. So she walked around, like four or five months pregnant, she walked around the house and Jonah was exposed to, and Jonah was exposed to um, uh, Mozart since he was minus five, you know, minus five months old. And, um, you know, and then of course, like you know, 10 years later, we found out that it was, it was a whole, you know, so that the, you know, and he listened to baby Mozart CDs, etc. But, so, uh, what, they, but what they found is this. So the, the, what we found later is this. The people who did the study, uh, the guy, he liked Mozart. So he did the study, you know, um, and uh, what they found is when you listen to music, it activates your left brain and right brain. So during the time when you listen to music, it actually boosts your creativity because both uh, parts of the brain are working. When you stop listening 10 minutes later, that, you know, that uh, the benefit is gone. Um, so, but here's the punchline. If that guy liked ACDC instead of Mozart, because it doesn't matter which music it is, by the way. Mm -hmm. It could be classical, it could be any music. Uh, if, if the study said ACDC makes you genius, Jonah would be listening to ACDC or whatever. <laughs> uh, and a lot more nervous. <laughs> that, that, that's right. Yeah, but, 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 on a, but on a serious note, like if you, if you uh, so I, when I write in the morning, I listen to classical music. Now, what they found in the study that when you listen to music that has words, actually it could be counterproductive because your brain starts processing, processing words and actually, actually make, reduce your creativity. So, and like, uh, and also it had very personal choice in the sense that, for instance, when I write, I can't listen to violin concertos because violin is too overpowering for me. So I listen to any other music but violin concertos when I write. So. Huh. And, and the interesting thing is I can't listen to anything when I write. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't have things going on in the background. I, I, need, to, I need it just to be quiet because I'm sort of talking to myself when I write. If I talk to myself, I'm interrupting whatever is going in the back, or it's interrupting me. And, and you might have two sides to your brain, but I think I only have one. No, so that just my wife is listening to this right now. And this is very important because she says, like, so the way it works, I have, a, I have an armchair right next to our bed, so I wake up at 5 in the morning, 
put my headphones and I write and she wakes up because I'm talking when I'm writing. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I just wanted I just want you to know that I'm not the only one who does that. So um, so uh, uh, during our walks, uh, uh, w uh, you, you have uh, an, an incredible um, love for your children, uh, w which is obvious because uh, about every third step, one of them is mentioned. And uh, so I, I just met them for the first time tonight, which was a great joy for me. Uh, because I've known Jonah for almost five years now and never met him. And uh, the same thing with Hannah and Mia, Sarah. I sort of known them all and uh, know what they're each doing. And, and uh, uh, incidentally, Hannah, I got to get you to teach chess to my grandson who was desperate to learn chess. So Hannah is becoming a, a, like a grand chess master at 17 and whatever. Uh, and, and that's great. Um, how, how do your kids play a role in this book? And why do you use them so liberally in this book, in the stories that you tell, which are fabulous stories? I think the they way. could ask for royalties at some point. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the, what's, what's interesting, um, I think two things that had a tremendous impact on me as an individual, writing and having children. And, um, and uh, I think, and now combine them together, it's, you know, because you know, writing about children, actually, you know, it's even greater. Um, why do I use them in my book? Why do I tell, um, because I think I, a lot of times I see life through them. I get to experience, I, can to, I get to relieve my childhood through them as well. Um, also, I get to, I, I cannot tell you how much smarter I became by being a parent because, and uh, how less hypocritical I became. Because I'll, I'll give you one example. Um, so I smoked a long time ago. Uh, and I quit smoking when I, was, when I was 21. And then, you know, when you were in Mexico and I was 30 years old and I was smoking a cigar. Like, and I don't smoke, you know. And, and Jonah was a few years old. And he asked me, do you smoke a cigar? Is that okay? And I realized I didn't want to explain Jonah how it's not so bad for me because I don't do it so often. And it just, I just didn't want to be a hypocrite. And that was the last time I smoked a cigar. Um, so, uh, so why do I, this is such a good question. And I'm not sure I, I really have a great answer except there are a lot of stories come from being around them. I think this, you know, it, in reality, if you think about it, I'm a storyteller. Like, you know, and a, a lot of stories come from being around them and just the experiences we have with them. So I think that's, that's why I am, basically. Well, and, and, and also, um, you, you travel a lot, and you often take one or two or all three of them on these trips. You just got back from India, and uh, we're having a long conversation about the difference between living in India, where there is certain, where is, there is great freedom and great prov poverty, versus living in Switzerland, where there is great wealth and almost no freedom, and uh, a freedom of action. I mean, uh, everything is put, is policed, and and everything is prim and proper. You can't step out of line, uh, but it's beautiful. There is no dirt on the streets. There is no poverty. There's Whereas in India, it's there is filth everywhere and uh, and the like. And you were talking about how um, how how Jonah had told you, or, or actually taught you, that when you see something that's unusual, like a new culture or a new place to be, um, what did he tell you? Yeah. So um, he uh, he took an anthropology class, and he in a. And, and uh, anthropologists, when they study new culture, they just observe, don't judge. And uh, that was uh, very interesting. So when you, when you when we went to India, I tried to, uh, and, and after the Switzerland, uh, we tried, Hannah and I talked about it all the time, observe, don't judge. Because when you get to India, it's a very different world. Like, uh, I'll give an example. We arrived to New Delhi, 
and uh, it took like in the morning, in the, in the morning, and uh, the the first thing I can, as, as the second I get off the plane, I realized I have a hard time breathing because the pollution is so horrible, and I had a cold too. Then we uh, were driven to a hotel, and there are cows crossing the street, and. Uh, and then you, you observe this incredible poverty that I have never seen before. Um, and it's an incredibly different culture where incredibly religious culture. Religion is so uh, infused into this culture. So the people are incredibly kind. It's, you know, it's, I, I was really shocked by, by how incredible people are in India. And, uh, and then you know, there was a, the, if you, the, like, to describe the streets, you have a, a one or two lane road, and there are six lanes created. And, and well, like, the, like one way, you have, a, you have a, a guy pushing a fruit cart. There is a cow crossing the street. There is a whole bunch of cars you know, uh, going left to right. There's a whole bunch of rickshaws, which is you know, three, you know, kind of, uh, three, uh, three motorcycles. And everybody's pushing a horn. And like in the United States, when you push a horn, it's actually or in Europe in general, it's basically considered to be rude. In India, it basically says, I'm here. And so if you look, the, the, the music of, uh, of New, uh, New Delhi is basically just horn, you know, this continuous horn and the sound of the horn, of the horns. But, uh, and uh, now, we, this is the interesting part. We observe this incredible poverty. And we, you know, and, uh, but we look at these people and they are as happy as, as you know, many faces I see here, a lot of them have been happier, and and you realize maybe maybe you know like we we assume kind of wealth equals to happiness, but these people like look to me like I would not know that you know that there is there is anything wrong with their life. They were completely content, and I think what you realize when you grow up and you know, when you grow up in this life, and you're not exposed to this life, I mean, you know, to, to the West or you know, et cetera, then you don't see that, you know, there's no contrast. And like, I'll give you one example, like this, this, this is the easiest example I can give. So just imagine that I, was grow, I grew up in Murmansk where there was no sunlight in the winter time. Now, for me, that was a normal life. I was not miserable, I was very happy because that's the only life I knew. Now, if you take one of my kids from sunny Denver and send them to, uh, and, and send them to uh, Murmansk, they would be miserable. Why? Because they went from the, one of the sunniest places in the world to one, you know, the, one that, you know, still, you know, the, the one that has the least amount of sun. So that contrast is actually very, you know, that would create a lot of pain unless they change their you know, perspective on this, you know, unless they look at it differently. Um, so once you in, so the beautiful part about going to India was actually that I went with Hannah. So Hannah and I could have these conversations and we would discuss this. And, uh, and I think that's what made the trip so much more special because, because of these conversations I have with Hannah. So I guess that answers your questions because that's, you know, nice. you know we, we go on trips with them and we have these conversations and they do something silly or whatever. And that's, you know, that's why I write about them, yeah. Nice. So we, we talk a lot about, um, we talk a lot about um, philosophy when we're talking, when we're walking, and we talk a lot about Judaism, um, and we talk about different cultures and the way in which different people think and uh, attitudes and the like. And you have two sections in your book on Stoicism and on the Stoic philosophers. So when did you decide that um, Epictetus and Seneca and and uh, Marcus Aurelius and the rest of the Stoic philosophers had something to tell you or teach you. So uh, this is actually, it's very interesting, sorry. The book was done. Like I literally was working in the last chapter. And then I, like I, it was literally, it was done. It's, it's you know, it's a, the, and, um, and then I stumbled on a quote by um, Epictetus, which uh, talked about the economy of control. And the Academy of Control basically says something very simple. Some things are up to us, some things aren't. I know this is not the most earth-shattering quote you heard today. <laughs> but if you think about this, the, then he describes what is up to us. And the things that are up to us are basically uh, our actions, our behavior, and that's it, our values. 
everything else is not up to us. Just think about it. So like, everything else we get upset about, we have zero control over. So you're driving to this talk and the, every light you hit is a red light, not under your control. Your spouse uh, is not kind to you at you know, that moment in time. Zero control over that. Um, and once you start looking through at life from this lens, you realize that you should be focusing on things you can control. Control the controllables, which is basically how you look at things, your behavior, uh, how you frame things. Um, and that, uh, that clicked with me. Like this, that was like, you know, as I described, like, you know, the Tiva moment like, you know, when I started writing. That really, that, you know, reading that quote basically really got me interested in, in the stoicism. So I called my editor, I said, I'll see you when I see you. And, you know, I'm gonna work on this. Um, and I did not have a deadline. I said, I'll, I'll, be, you know, I'll tell you when I'm done. And for the next six months, I studied stoicism. And one thing I do, I'm very good at this. When I get interested in something, I kind of have this zero, like this, I, I zero in, zoom in, and just nothing else exists. And um, I found stoic philosophy for me is a, an operating system for life. Let me, let me explain you what it means to me. When we are born with this blob of hardware, and then the software, written little by little, is written to us. The operating system is written to us. And it's usually it's hodgepodge. Our parents teach us, we read books, we have friends, things happen to us, and all those things form us. And what I found that Stoic philosophy gave me a very systematized operating system. And it's also, it's a kind of religion neutral. So it's a, you could be a deeply religious person and study Stoic philosophy, you could be an unreligious person and study Stoic philosophy. It has zero impact on this. In fact, let me tell you this. Every time I bring up something Stoic, my wife says, yeah, that's in the Torah. <laughs> so I, so you, you might as well say you can have a study Torah, a study Torah but a study Stoic philosophy. So, uh, well, it is in Torah. <laughs> the, Sto the Stoics would be nothing without Jewish philosophy, so it, it's okay. And speaking of Stoics, Epictetus, uh, one of your favorites, said, um, never, please, never depend on the admiration of others. Yeah. Well, so ex exactly. So if you think about the academy of control, you can't control what other people think of you. All you can do is to be behave in an uh, admirable way. I was thinking actually, but let me give you another example. If you think about a lot of movie stars or rock stars that are basically incredibly unhappy because they tie their happiness to a deletion of others, which they can't control. Right. And, um, and if you think about actors like Robert Redford that are, seem like normal human beings, they, can, they don't live in Los Angeles, they live somewhere in Utah. You know? um, so that's very important. By the way, as a writer, that's very important. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not Lady Gaga of writing, et cetera. Uh, but I do write articles, I do get feedback from, from, from my readers, and I try to not tie my happiness of how many emails I receive, how many replies I receive to, my, you know, to what I wrote. I, I'm just want to write the best article that I'm proud of. But the, the, the upside of that is, um, it, it's interesting that we are the only ones who have control over what, who we are and what we do. And yet so many people become unhappy because they give over their own opinion of themselves to others, which is, which is foolish, because you can never please everyone else. In fact, you can never please anyone else, really, because everyone else receives what you give with their own perspective. And if it appeals to them, then they take it. But if it doesn't appeal, then they blame you for trying to give them what you're trying to give them. So uh, to a certain extent, um, you have to be satisfied with who you are, what you do, and how you do it. And, and that's what makes life, that's what makes you happy. You, 
you yeah. succeed in your own in your own mind. And I think this is kind of the goal of Stoic philosophy is kind of reduce the suffering, you know, because we we go through life experience a lot of unnecessary suffering, yeah. and if you frame things differently, if you look at the world slightly differently, just little tweaks, suddenly there's a lot less, lot less pain, and less pain there is more happiness. That's, oh, that's, it's, that's, that's simple. <laughs> if you're a masochist. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're a masochist. Right. And by the way, like, just talk, talk about Stoics, there's you know, basically most of the writings you know, we have today came from three Stoic philosophers. You know, it's the Epictetus, who was a slave, then there was the uh, uh, Seneca, who was a, uh, like the Renaissance man, I don't know, five, you know, five or 10 centuries before Renaissance. He was, the, he was a playwright, he was a senator, he was the banker, everything, you know. Uh, one of the wealthiest men, uh, men in Rome. And then there was Marcus Aurelius, and to me this is the most fascinating out of all of them, for this reason. Marcus Aurelius was the most powerful man in Europe. In the, in the world, period. And he, unlike, and you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely, but in his case, I would argue Stoic philosophy made him uncorruptible. He did not execute his enemies. He was a very fair ruler. And uh, so, uh, like, like I look at him, and this is like one, of, like one of the people I would want to be, you know, like I, wanna, I would want to be like him. Not the emperor of Rome, but the, <laughs> I, w I would like to have very high moral standards. Yeah, he, yeah he, he was sort of the embodiment of what Machiavelli a, century, a, a millennia later would, would really talk about as the ideal ruler, a person with absolute power who cared absolutely about everyone he ruled over, which was phenomenal. And speaking of Seneca, um, he, he was a Roman, but he lived in Spain for a long time. And his statue is in, um, at the gate of Seville. Uh, there's a statue of Seneca um, be, because of his great thoughts. Yeah, or maybe he was Spanish who lived in Rome, but anyway, they, yeah. So um, he, he, had a, he had a statement that, um, uh, that we were gonna talk about, never got to, uh, something like, uh, Time reveals truth, and and we never really got to that discussion. But I I'll give you thirty seconds to tell me everything you want to tell me. About. Time reveals truth. So if you think about time, dis time, time discovers time discovers truth. Yeah. So I mean, if you think about investing, like this is like perfect quote for investing, right? Because. As an investor, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to buy a company that's undervalued, right? And I want the market to recognize that it's undervalued at some point in time. So at some point, if I'm right, time will discover the truth and the stock will go up because it was undervalued. But I think it's also, like, I think it could be a motor of life. You know, this could be just the, how we go through life. Because I, I look at myself as a student of life, a person who wants to always learn. And so when I have a debate with somebody, I want to have an intellectual honest debate where we look for truth. Because at some point in time we'll discover it. We'll discover that. So that's how I look when I have debates, when I have conversations. Um, when, I'm de uh, when I have a conversation with somebody who uh, comes to this conversation without uh, willingness to learn, it becomes very uninteresting to me. Because there is no truth will be discovered at the end. So that's. That's a 30 second answer. Um, one of the things we were starting to talk about a little bit this week was um, the concept of reframing, which I think is really a, a critical parenting tool, but it's also a critical tool for just getting through life. Maybe spend a, a little time talking about what you mean you have, a, you have a chapter in here about reframing, but it's... Let, let me give you the, the simplest example. There's the simplest example. Let's say somebody comes to you, puts a gun to your head, and say you have to run 26 miles. Okay, and you're like, oh, God, I have to do this, and it's, you know, you're forced to do this, right? And you're doing it, you're dreading doing this, right? But then if you think about it, millions of people run marathons every year, and nobody, <laughs> because they chose to do that, right? So a lot of times, it's really how you look at things, 
like a lot of times, which, you know, um, when, I'll give like another example, you're stuck in traffic and you are dreading this because there is a warm meal sitting at home waiting for you. So now you feel horrible. Or, but at the same time, you can reframe it and say, I have actually, I have time to listen to my favorite podcast for the next 30 minutes. So suddenly, this, you know, been, instead of being stuck in traffic, you have time for yourself to, you know, to spend, you know, sp you know, to listen to your favorite podcast. So this is just you know, some of the examples of reframing, but it's incredibly powerful. Again, little tweaks. But, um, and I would argue the Stoic philosophy, it's really, I would call it like a Stoic practice. Because you know, I sound like you know, I sound like I do. You know, it's a you have to practice this because it doesn't come naturally to us. Right. It's I think the you know kind of dread you know dreading that you're stuck in traffic. That's the natural behavior for us. But then teaching yourself that you have to you know reframe it, and you can you know noticing that you are first of all you have to notice. First of all, you have to notice that. Uh, you look at it from a negative perspective. You know, yeah. once you notice it, then you have opportunity to reframe it. And you know, you talked about the fact that we have chores that we often have to do that are are just not chores that we look forward to doing. They're an imposition on our time, they're an imposition on our 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 day, what have you. Uh, but you can reframe that imposition as a positive. And you start to look forward to being able to do it. The perfect example is that um, I used to look at driving my kids to school as a chore, and uh, you know because I wanted to get to work, you know, as soon as possible. But then I realized that they, at some point they grow up. In fact, uh, if you, somebody did the math and found that. Um, by the time your kids are in high school, you spend 93% of the time you're ever gonna spend with them. 93% of the time. So once they're out of school, because when, are, when they live with you, 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 know, you see them all the time. The second they get out of the house, you start seeing them a fraction, a tiny fraction of what you've seen them before. So, um, so once I realized that at some point they grow up, which is, by the way, that's a negative, that's another story concept, negative visualization. I realized that's finite. Um, like Hannah, my, my daughter Hannah is, um, uh, she's in 11th grade, so I'm probably gonna drive her to school another 200 something times. And after that, she'll be driving herself to, you know, to college. And so now, every single day when I drive Mia, Sarah, and Hannah to school, actually, in all honesty, Hannah drives us both now. Uh, but I, I treasure those moments. And now, because, I, and so it's a reframing. And, and also what happens now, I'm fully, when I'm in the car with them, I'm fully present. Okay, so I'm giving full attention. And I, you know, so, so that's, that, that's another example of reframing. Yeah? Yeah. Something I used to dread doing, now I love doing. Yeah, I, I, was, uh, I'm, uh, I was telling you that um, over, over the course of, of of my rabbinate here, um, I had four or five assistants. And the first thing I would tell them uh, is I would tell them what God said to Moses. God says to Moses, uh, just before the Mount Sinai experience, he says to Moses, come up, to, up the mountain to me and be here. And the rabbis asked the question, isn't that a redundancy? Of course you're there when you get up there. But it's like, here's the advice. Wherever you are, be there, be in the moment. So I would say to them, if you're doing a bar mitzvah, be at the bar mitzvah. Don't be writing a sermon that you have to give next Friday night, be at the bar mitzvah. If you're doing a wedding, be at that wedding at that moment. And after the wedding is over, you can be wherever you want to be, but at that moment, be there. And uh, I, I think it was the best advice I could give to a, a young rabbi just getting ready to go, go into a career. I have two comments on this. Uh, one is from the book, another one is not. So this is a fresh, new, fresh uh, perspective. Um, I, my father and I were in Vienna 
and we went, you know, we, you know, we went to Vienna Opera. Also, oh, so it's, 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 it's where we were in Vienna. We were going to, from, museum, from museum to museum. And my father said, you always want to be somewhere else. You want to be in the next place. And he was so right because I was, we went to the opera and I'm sitting in the opera listening to the La Boheme. And then I'm thinking about the eggs I'm going to have for breakfast tomorrow. <laughs> like, like just, just, just think about this, right? And, and this actually, my father's words had a huge impact on me because I, th you know, I started to inhale life a lot more after that. I became more present. But let me give you this framework. This is, this is the framework how I, you can go through life two ways. Okay, the, here's one framework. You arrive, let's say you've never been to Barcelona, okay? You wanted to visit the city for, you know, for, for, for a long time. You arrive to Barcelona, you get off the plane, and you rush into a baggage claim to get your, you know, to, uh, to, uh, to get your bags. Then you get in, you know, and uh, you're not looking left or right, you're just looking straight. You're not noticing anything, okay? And you got your baggage, you know, you got your bags, you got Uber, you left, right? That state of mind, there were people walking around you. There were shops, there were maybe art on the walls, you know, but you completely ignore that you just look forward, okay? That's a, that's a kind of always thinking about tomorrow, like always thinking about, oh, I wanna go see Barcelona, but I'm not paying attention to what's around me. But then there is another mode, and this is the mode that I'm, you know, that's what you're describing. Imagine you go into, I love impressionists. So imagine you are in the Denver Art Museum and they have a impressionist you know, exhibit. And you go from painting to painting, the world outside of you does not exist. There is maybe an exit sign on the door somewhere, but you're not even paying attention to it. You're just focusing, going from painting to painting, paying attention to nothing else but the art. You're fully present. And I would argue that's kind of been, been mindful, that's been present, that's be, you know, be, you know, be there, be here. Um, and that's the mode I would want to spend most of my time, kind of in the art museum mode, not in the airport mode. Nice. Um, how do you deal with failure? I much better uh, than before. And I, because I failed, you know, like, no, and, I, and I, I tell you this, because now I look at failure as opportunity to learn. And I you know it sounds um, like I learned, actually I learned to appreciate failure as when I started to run my, my, uh, my firm, because I cannot tell you how much I failed. By the way, if you're an investor, you have to prepare that you're gonna fail as well. This, 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 that's just part of you know, being an investor. So I just look at it as an opportunity to learn. And, um, and sometimes the failure is extremely painful. Um, but that's when you grow. Um, so I, I mean, I'd like to fail as much as the next guy. Like, you know, I would rather not fail. Um, but at the same time, when I fail it, I just, I look at it as, that's just part of life. And I'm, I, it doesn't bother me that much anymore. So you just, you just let it go. No, I just I, I want to want to see how what what can I learn from this? Oh, is is there something is there something I can learn from this that could improve? You know, that's that's how I look at failure. So um, the last chapter of your book is entitled "Stop Eating Sugar," which is kind of a weird thing to end a book with. But what the heck? <laughs> Where did that come from? So. Um, so here's the story. So I, I decided I'm going to write a book about life. My wife, Rachel, tells me, aren't you kind of too young to write a book about life? And, you know, and, I, and I can see the skepticism, right? Because you know, usually people in their 70s or 80s write about life because yeah. they come retrospective. And, and then I was thinking about Warren Buffett, who thought he was going to start giving kind of money away at the very end of his life. But then he realized that that money is sitting there doing nothing, and he could be helping people. So I realized that my articles sit in my head until I'm 80 or something, but they could help somebody in the meantime. So I, I told her, you know what, I'm gonna name this book, Solonic, well, whatever the title is, volume one. So I, then I can add other volumes, but the why it's called Stop It in Sugar is this. Um, the, uh, this woman brings her son to Dalai Lama, and that's the story. And, uh, and she tells him, listen, my son eats too much sugar. Could you please talk to him? 
And the Dalai Lama looks at the woman, looks at Hassan, and says, now, why don't you come back next month? OK. So the woman brings Hassan again next month. Um, says, you know, you and I talked a month ago. You told me to come back. She said, yes, that's fine. He looks at the sun and says, stop eating sugar. The woman is bewildered. Like, like I was here a month ago. You could have said the same thing. <laughs> he says, but yeah, but first I had to stop eating sugar myself. <laughs> so by the way, this, that's, that is probably one of the best examples of parenting, period, right? Because you don't want to. But, I, but also, this book is really just my journey of trying to stop eating sugar. Like, I, I'm sure a lot of things I write about, I fail at them all the time. And you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fail at them. I'm going to learn. I keep going forward. And uh, so that's, you know, that's why I ended this way. So it's kind of a, it's a, uh, I, I, I think the, uh, the, the very last words in the book that this is not the uh, end, this is the intermission. <laughs> uh, um, if you could only keep one section in the book, which one would it be? I think, oh God, it depends for what reason. So for the one I learned the most, Stoic philosophy. The one I wanted my kids to read, uh, to learn about my childhood, would be the introduction to the book. Sure. So this, you know, it depends from, you know, in fact, the book, the, the book, the education to the book reads to, uh, uh, to Jonah, Hannah, Mia, Sarah, because you don't read my emails. Yeah. Can I tell you just one cute story? Because this is, she's going to kill me if I don't. So, I, so my, my second book, the little book of Sideways Market. Is, it was written in 2010, just very important. The date is very important. And it was dedicated to Jonah and Hannah. Right. OK. Mia Sarah found this book. Now she can read. She's nine. And she reads the dedication. She's like, what about me? <laughs> like, <laughs> what, I've chopped liver? <laughs> <laughs> so, so she was born, you know, 2014, and um, so I, and she, she still cannot forgive me for that. So, so this, the, the reason, so the fact that this book is dedicated to her as well, this is my way to kind of to. So, you get, so in the next book, so in, in in another book, you're gonna have to just dedicate it to her, so that you're even. I, 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 might, I, might, I might have to, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll see to it. <laughs> Um, any any last words that you want to throw out, and then maybe we can open it up for two questions. And anybody have a question? Oh uh, well, this last time we just walked around Eastmore Park, zip zip zip, uh, because it really isn't where we walk, because we're in the moment and. We start talking, and I'm not thinking about walking. And I'm only thinking about what we're talking about. And there, there's really never a lag in the conversation. It just goes from one thing to another, and it's just a, a most pleasant experience. I mean, Vitaly is, aside from my kids who are his age, uh, Vitaly's my youngest friend. Um, and so, you know, because you get to be, you know, late 60s, um, <laughs> you, don't, you don't have many young friends any longer. And so, uh, you know, I was able to cultivate him and, uh, and share with him a little bit of my wisdom and a lot of bit of his wisdom. So it's, it's very good. We just, we walk all over. He, he has a a really beautiful area behind his office building that has ponds and it goes under this, a street and it's got all kinds of nice places to walk. Um, and so we go there every once in a while, but any park benches. is good. As long as they have benches for me. And they also have benches, yeah. right, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So you said that you got a lot of feedback from your readers. Where, where did you publish these articles where you got feedback from so the, I'm going to repeat the question because uh, other, yeah. Yeah. so I got a lot of feedback from my readers. Where did I get the feedback? So um, 
Oh, so the so the so the articles so the, I would write an article. Like a lot of times, I wrote articles for think of major publication. I've written for them most likely, um, but also you know when I write an article, you have, like the, when I describe the article, the most weirdest thing, but it kind of makes sense. There is my father's art. There is a, some kind of personal story. There's an investment article. There's my brother's Alex's art, and then there is a, class, a section about classical music. And so people subscribe to my articles, and uh, I can tell you what you can subscribe if you'd like. It's absolutely free. And uh, they receive them by email when I write them. You know, so that, that's, that's how I get the feedback. So the articles go out to, and I have a very large number of people read the articles. And uh, you know, they get them, then they reply to me, and that's how I get the feedback. Yeah, yeah Marty. No, I, I've read the book, so I have questions. Um, can you tell? Um, a lot of what you've given here tonight is kind of broad, but can you give some of the specifics in the book that you give on like parenting, and I'm thinking of Jonah and the chess, when you hired the chess person for him and mm -hmm. how that turned out. And then when you talked about budgeting and how to keep people from fighting over finances, I thought that was, do you remember this? Yeah, 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 no, no, I didn't <laughs> <laughs> Wait, do I, do I need to tell you what you said? Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so this is actually issue. very interesting. So the the, the, the all right, this is actually, I've been, John and I have been talking a lot about this the last couple of days about, uh, about, about this. So when Jonah was, I don't know, 10, 12 years old, we hired them a chess teacher. You know, we, you know, we played chess, and I, we figured he needs a ch chess teacher. And we hired this wonderful guy who was probably in his 70s, who was a uh, champ, uh, Moscow's champion in chess you know, from Russia. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was a one. He was, you know, he still is a wonderful human being, but he taught chess like my Russian teachers taught me anything. Yeah. Very like so. The uh, there was a. I'm gonna pause this for a second and explain something else. The when the way Russians communicate and the way Americans communicate is very different. And the there's upsides and downsides to both, uh, uh, to both sides. So Russian communication is very direct. Sometimes it may, may be impolite. Also Russians, especially teachers, now I'm talking about teachers, never really cared about how the message is delivered. They just wanted to, they, they, they thought about giving a message as just data, but how they package it, didn't, you know, they didn't care about it. But the problem is there's, if, you were, if they were just talking computer to computer, then it will be fine, except there's a human being on the receiving side. So the way you package the message actually makes a huge difference. And so, so Jonas, the, so Americans on the other side, uh, extremely indirect. Like, and this was a cultural shock when I came to the United States. I, my first job was, uh, uh, we lived in Glendale, and I worked at Cherry Creek Health Club. This is two or three months into you know, living in the United States. And uh, a month into the job, I was getting fired. But the problem was, the guy who was, I barely understood English then, but the guy who was firing me was smiling all the time. So I was so confused because, am I getting fired or getting a raise? Because, <laughs> so, you know, and, you know, and so, the, so, the, so there is a problem, by the way, there is a problem with the indirectness as well. So there is a, you gotta find a balance, right? Because if a person on the other end does not know what you think, there is a problem with that as well. Um, so, the Jonah's chess teacher was basically beat any love Jonah had to chess out of him completely. So, and Jonah, you know, quit, you know, played chess for a while. He, you know, quit playing chess. And I realized that when we, when we get teachers for Hannah, so they, many years later, my daughter Hannah decided, you know, watch Queen's Gambit, and she wanted to play chess. I was smarter at this point in time. And the teacher we hired her, she may not have been the best teacher. She may not have been Denver chess champion. But she, she, you know, she, you know, she taught in a way that Hannah got interested more and more in chess. So that's, so that's, so that's, so when you get, so as a, so as a parenting advice, I guess, when you get teachers, you don't just focus on their credentials, but also how they deliver the message. Do they get kids excited? Like at the same time, Hannah had a, this incredible Russian, Russian teacher who taught her Russian, and it was you know she it was such a sunshine that made Hannah actually you know want to study Russian more. So that's um, you had another question. What was the second part? The, oh, the bu budgeting. Yeah. 
Okay. So we talked a little bit about mindfulness, being, being present, right? So what happens, the, so, all right, so Rita and I get married. A few months, uh, yeah, we had very little money. She's so into it, we have no money. <laughs> we have no money, and uh, my friend Mark, who was, I, I was at the time 28, and Mark was 38, he uh, took us out to lunch. And, and he basically, and so just I want to give you some context. At this point in time, I had a CFA, which is like one of the biggest designations to get in my profession, and I must have a master's degree in finance, just so innocent. So Mark starts telling me, listen, you guys, you need to create a budget. And he starts telling me, budget is this, you get your paycheck, that's your income, you get your cable bill, your mortgage, et cetera, that's your expenses. I'm listening to this like, like I got a master's degree in finance, just FYI. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and I'm kind of sl getting slightly annoyed. And then Mark starts telling me, so you, you, you got the you know, but then he said, you, what you want to do, you want to put, start thinking about expenses that are not happening in this moment in time, but will happen in the future. Like, uh, at some point, some, uh, let's say five years from now, you're gonna buy a new car. Okay, let's say you're gonna trade in this car for $5,000 and, and you're gonna need $15,000. So that's $200 every month you have to save if five years from now you need the money, you know, you know, if you wanna pay this car, uh, cash for this car. You're also gonna have other expenses that always happen, they just don't happen every day. You go on vacations. So you need, you know, so instead of borrowing money to go on vacations, you wanna save up for them. So, so suddenly, as oh, retirement and uh, uh, kids' college education, all these different things. So once you start constructing your budget and you put expenses that you can see, then you start putting expenses you don't see. And, what, and then whatever is left, that's the money you can take and go to Las Vegas, right? Now, what's important about this, if you think about budget, all it is, it's a prioritization tool. Because then you have to start looking at this and you say, what's important to me? Is a, is a new car more important to me than a, a trip to Mexico? Or, you know, and then, it's, by the way, there is no answer, like there's no right or wrong answer. It just, it's gonna be different for everybody. So you start prioritizing things. You've been mindful. Now, imagine what happens to a lot of people. This is a typical American story. You drive to work for the first time, you see a Starbucks, you stop by, you buy the $5 drink. Next day, you, you, know, you drive again, you buy another $5 drink. And you start, and once, if you did it twice, especially if you're Jewish, it becomes a tradition, right? <laughs> so, and so suddenly, suddenly you discover you spent, you, know, you don't even discover this, but at the end you spent $2,000 a year on Starbucks. Now, if you really, really enjoy this frappuccino, whatever that is, then that's fine. But if you're doing it mindlessly, you realize that $2,000 I could have spent on something else that actually be it Chipotle, be it vacation, be it skin, whatever. But now, so now what, what I'm trying to do with this, you know, in, in, the, uh, in the chapter, explain that, you, that money buys the most when you buy things that, val that are valuable to you. So not every $100 is created equal. When you buy something that's not valuable to you, it's really wasted money. So, so this is kind of the, I give you a very, like, you know, highlight of budgeting, you know, that's, yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, yeah. that made it interesting as a parent. I also I'm sure there are other people with questions. If not, I will continue. But I think, I think there were questions. I, th I think there were questions. Hopefully. Questions, don't be shy. Uh, yes, hi, right behind you. Yeah, hi. Um, I we actually talked a little bit about your dad's art because I love seeing the paintings when you send your newsletter up. And um, he's, he's fantastic. The art is fantastic. And then I want to know how you apply the dichotomy of control to the best. Oh, I mean. Stop freaking out. Oh no. Okay. So that, that is a great. Uh, so I. Uh, so my father, uh, uh, so when he lived in Moscow, when he was seven years old, he started painting, and he painted all his life. But his day job, he was a professor at university, so he painted, never sold his art. In fact, he always looked at selling art as almost like selling his soul. Like, like he was always afraid that if you start selling art, he'll start painting for what's popular, you know, and um, when we moved to the United States, he was 58 years old, very, at this point, at this, you know, at this age, very difficult to learn, like, you know, uh, brand new language. 
And uh, he had, incre you know, had incredible vocabulary, but just, if, you know, just imagine kind of a cerebral, shy person. So he never really uh, uh, perfected the language to communicate well. So he just started uh, selling his art. And uh, that's, you know, and, uh, and that's, and he, you know, for a long time he used to sell it, he stopped selling it now, but that's how he earned his living for a long time. Um, and I kind of, you know, I'm a proud son, and I, I thought my father's art is wonderful. I'm sure every son thinks his father's art is wonderful, so I started including him in my emails. And uh, the, the funny story about this, of course, is that, like, I included them in my emails, and, uh, and then one day I forgot. And I get this email from a reader saying, Vitaly, your article is fine, but please don't send them out without your father's art. <laughs> so that's it, that's yeah. Um, the, the Academy of Control and Investing, that is actually perfect application of the principle. As an investor, what control do I have over? You know, what things do I have control over? I have a control over process, and basically nothing else. When I buy the stock, I have no idea what's going to happen in the global economy. What's going to you know if there's a if this company's warehouse will will set you know catch on fire, etc. So. You know, the, as an investor, you want to focus on things you can control, and that's your process. And then you just you realize that however the market decides, especially in the stock market, you know, your stocks get priced every day. There's a, millions of people have an opinion what your company is worth every single day. A lot of them don't do research, whatever. So, but you just have to remember those are opinions. So, uh, you know, when I wake up in the morning and I find out, you know, my portfolio is down, whatever, just remind myself, things I can control is my process, what the, how the market is, decides to price them on a the, on daily basis, whatever, completely not up to me. That, that's, you know, that's one way to look at it, yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Mia, oh my God, you have a, Mia Sarek is gonna, what sounds ask a question. driving us to school, that's totally a lie. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. She, it's a, this, is, this is not a question, this is a statement. She says, when you say that when you're driving us to school, you've been in the present, that's a totally a lie. <laughs> that, was, that, that, was, that, was, that was not a question. That was it. <laughs> remember, how I, remember how I started this thing saying that it's so weird have the characters of your book being in the audience, well, now you see why. <laughs> yeah, was there a question there, or that was just a, that was just a statement? <laughs> all right, all right. I'm afraid that my son John is going to ask me something now. <laughs> all right. Well, uh, our, one more question. You know, Vitaly, Will you bring your family on stage so we can kind of meet them? Because yes. we've heard about oh them. Oh, my God. Uh, all right. This oh, is, sure. All right, sure. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. And your, brother, your brothers, too. Oh, yeah, Alex, where are you? Oh, we're <laughs> sure. Oh, yeah. What's up, everyone? <laughs> oh, God. Nice. <laughs> 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 oh, here we are. So this is it. <laughs> Thank you so nice. much. Well, um, it was uh, nice being here. Thank you, Vitaly, for coming and sharing yourself with us.